<clears throat> Welcome in, Jake West, director of Team FYN Sports, joined by Caleb Tallman. Caleb, a really good week of football last week. Seems like we're spoiled being in, in the mountain area and in the Smoky Mountain Conference um, and just around Western North Carolina as a whole with uh, every week just being good football, especially when we get into conference play. Um, Caleb, let's highlight some of the individual players that had really good games last week, uh, starting out with our Team FY and Sports Players of the Week. Absolutely. Uh, some really good performances out there. Starting off in Robbinsville, even though Robbinsville lost, uh, Carlos Wesley had uh, no, no blame in that loss as he had two quarterback hurries and 15 tackles as well as being – a big component on their offensive line. Uh, it's a great week uh, by Wesley. Uh, he'll be an important cog going forward for them, especially if if uh, Cutler Adams, which we'll get to later, is still going to be out. Uh, and then uh, highlight a, a little bit of a player that you might not think of too much, but I tell you what, he kind of had a little bit of a coming out game. They switched uh, Joe Swain, Murphy's Player of the Week, to linebacker this week. Um, and he played great at the linebacker spot, had a couple quarterback hurries. And then on the offensive line, had three pancake blocks. And so if they can continue to get good production out of, out of uh, senior Joe Swain, that'll be good for Murphy. Uh, Isaac Weaver, uh, good to see him getting back to full health. Um, another dominant rushing week for him. Seven tackles on defense. I think he also had an interception. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jake, on D. Um, but just uh, not not enough for Andrews to get the job done. Um Good week for Lane O'Dell for Hayesville. He was probably one of the few bright spots on their offensive line um, and one of the few guys that could stand up to the test of Murphy's D tackles and, and D ends. Um, and just a guy that, you know, we wanted to give a little love to because week in and week out, he's one of Hazel's best offensive linemen. Uh, one of those guys when you see Hazel running backs get player of the week, he, he's often deserving as well. Uh, Swain's whole defense. Uh, I mean, you know, they allowed – 13 Defense. passing yards. What, what was the stat, yeah, Jake? 17, Andrews passing. Right in there. Uh, yeah, I think it was, I think it was 2 of 17, Andrews passing, only 12 points allowed. And then uh, Elijah Wadi, um, a transfer that Cherokee got this offseason, had a big game. 10 tackles on D, a solo interception. Uh, and I believe he also made a few plays on offense. So um, pretty solid performances all around the conference this week, Jake. Yeah, for sure. Um, great individual performances. We really like to highlight those individuals. Um, but let's get into just the meat of last week's games. Um, tell us a little bit about the Franklin game against North Henderson, uh, Caleb. Oh, uh, yeah. I think uh, I think we expected Franklin to play the way they did. Um, finally kind of got out of a two-game losing rut, which uh, I think surprised everybody. Um, Chris McGuire got back to his accurate passing ways. Uh, doesn't mean they were only doing bubble screens. I mean, he was 13 of 17 uh, for 265 yards. He had a 79-yard long, 118 quarterback rating, uh, 76 completion rating. Um, their run game still, uh, I think they're still trying to find some answers. They rushed 44 times, Jake, for 239 yards, which sounds like a lot. Um, but they were only averaging five yards a carry uh, against a, a fairly weak North Henderson team. Um, I think they're still reeling from the loss of Braden Watts and trying to find some answers uh, rushing the ball. Obviously, Ty Hanley is their go-to running back. Uh, but Kellen Stiles rushed 12 times for 78 yards. Uh, and so you, you may see some more Kellen Stiles at the running back fullback position going forward uh, with Watts out. And McGuire only rushed the ball four times um, in the game. Obviously, with them being up pretty big, you save your – your quarterback runs for when you really need him trying to keep McGuire healthy. Uh, and then you got to highlight Keegan Pollock, Jake. He had six receptions for 177 yards. Uh, and then not only that, he had 11 tackles on defense. Uh, and so Franklin getting back on the right side of things, obviously they got a really big game that we'll get into in a little bit coming up with Smoky Mountain. Um, but yeah, I think, I think Franklin's back on the right side of things. If they had a struggle with Norris Henderson, uh, you, uh, their whole outlook on their season may have changed. I mean, right right now, you know, um, yeah, you're probably going to have to go on the road for some playoffs. But uh, if they can find a way to win out or, you know, maybe only pick up one more loss and, and go into playoffs, a three-loss team, they're a team that, you know, no team in, in 3A football wants to see them come to their place on a playoff night. Uh, 
So I think Franklin's uh, starting to right that ship a little bit and figure out some of their injuries. Uh, and obviously, if McGuire can continue to have those kind of nights, that's what we saw him do against Hazel and Murphy, Jake. And when he plays like that, uh, Franklin's a really tough team to beat. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. Um, I, they're, they're, I think the emergence of Kellen Styles last week is something that they're going to really rely more on, especially with Watts uh, being out for the rest of the year. So, but like you said, they've got to figure out some some semblance of a run game. And, and I think Kellen Styles. And Ty Henley may just be the one-two punch they need. Um, but also Inslee, um, I mean, he rushed 10 times for 30 yards. But you never know. Any of those guys are capable of, bu of busting one right down the seam and, and taking it uh, for six at any point in time. So hopefully they can get uh, something going. And that will open up McGuire and Pollock and Adams in the pass game uh, later on down the road. Yeah, and, I, and honestly, you know, I'd almost look to see – I know they do a lot of that bubble screen stuff, but – I would even say, you know, maybe do you start to use um, Keegan Pollock and Grant Adams on some jet sweeps or some even some bubble passes uh, or those little pop passes they throw right in front as a way to to open up your run game a little bit and just try to get the ball into your best player's hands. I mean, we see Murphy do a lot of that with um, – gosh, I'm blanking on his name, Jake. He had a, had a huge game against Hazel last week. Juan Allen, I don't know. My, my brain's not there this this morning, Jake. But Juan Allen, they do, Murphy does a lot of that stuff with Juan Allen and Peyton McCracken, um, where it's, you know, I call it the faux running game, where is it really running game or are you just finding a way to get the ball into your best player's hands uh, in a positive situation? <clears throat> yeah, that's true. Let's move on to that Hayesville and, and Murphy game. I think you've got some highlights from that, Caleb, if you want to roll them. Um, you were there at that game. What – was I mean Murphy's kind of struggled defensively what did they what kind of changes did they make in order to only hold Hayesville to 14 points well I think they're I think their linebacking core uh played really well they pressured uh Logan Caldwell all night long and uh obviously um Hazel's run game as you saw a fumble right there two two big turnovers from Hazel stalled drives and then one of the big things is um it, it, it was uh, a defense more reminiscent of um the Nelson era as D coordinator I think Hazel got in the red zone was it was either two or three times where they got in the red zone and went for it on all four downs and Murphy's defense bowed up and stopped them um and so that's the kind of D that Murphy has to have. I mean, let's be honest. Their defense is not going to be a – we're going to force a bunch of three and outs. They just don't have those players this year. But if you can bow up and be strong in the red zone and force field goals or force uh, failed fourth down conversions, here's one of the big fumbles they force right there. Um, you know, that's the kind of defense that we've seen from Murphy for years, and that's what they're going to need to do if they want to make a run uh, in the 1A playoffs. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Their defense is gonna it's definitely going to have to tighten up, but it seems like they may have turned the corner last week. And as you can see, just by watching some of these highlights, um, Kellen Rumfelt seemed like he got back on the wagon and was delivering some. That some it's the calls. best. It's the best Kellen Rumfelt's looked all year, in my opinion. I mean, I know they blew out Hazel, but it doesn't matter. Early in the game, late in the game, when he was throwing the ball, he was really effective. Yeah, and that's definitely what you want to see, especially getting into this gauntlet stretch you've got with Robbinsville, Swain, and then Andrews, the top three teams in the conference thus far, uh, back to back to back. So that's that's good, really good to see. And it also seemed to me like they they got a lot of people involved in the backfield. Uh, as you see, Hunter Stalkup right there taking it in for a touchdown. Uh, him, Jawan, uh, and Ty Laney, as you see Ty right there, they seem to be splitting their carries pretty evenly, and that's something that's going to help uh, come playoff time whenever they maybe do need to lean on Ty Laney, their, their number one back a little more. Um, he's going to be a lot fresher than some of these teams that don't quite have the depth. Uh, Absolutely. The well, and I think you're starting to find out. I think, you know, especially if uh, John Ledford hurt this year, we don't know if he'll make it back to the end of the year or not. Uh, but regardless, a lot of people knew, okay, Ty Laney is our number one back, but who's our number two back? Who's our, you know – do we have a change of pace, Dyers? Are we going to be giving it to Ty Laney 30 times a game? Well, Hunter Stallcup's starting to show up uh, as a young piece, but but really Juan Allen is has arrived on the scene. And he is – honestly, Juan Allen's the playmaker I thought uh, Peyton McCracken would be this year for Murphy. I mean, Juan's, Juan's doing it all for him. 
Yeah, he is. He's a really good receiver, and he's he's really good at playing the position that he does uh, coming out of the backfield. Uh, it's just got some speed that's kind of unrivaled in, in right around in this area. I mean, we're used to just bully ball, but Juwan brings the speed that kind of separates him from some of the other players in the yeah, league. I'm not he, saying he's, he's got that. He's got that make you miss ability too. You know, he's the. I can juke two guys out in a phone booth. Uh, and, and really, the conference doesn't have a ton of those guys this year uh, as they've had in years past. But uh, Juan, Juan definitely wins uh, the Madden Madden Juke Stick Award if we had one this year. Yeah, for sure. Let's go. Let's get into the, the two other games in the conference from last week. Um, a big surprise to most people uh, over in Cherokee as Robbinsville dropped that game 20 to 7 against Cherokee once again fumbles were fumbles and turnovers were the, were the reason for the loss for Robbinsville um what were your thoughts on this one Caleb and you as you went back and watched it and got some of these highlights yeah I mean you saw it from the first play Dason Gross threw a bad interception there I don't really know what he saw um and I, I just think without Cutler Adams Robbinsville has no identity you know Jay I mean Obviously, their other identity, I guess, is is try to get the ball to Adams, uh, Brock Adams, I believe that is his name. Uh, I mean, Robbinsville's offense just struggling, and Cherokee did what they did. I mean, like, it, it wasn't like Cherokee came out and ran a bunch of wrinkles, Jake, and, and really caught Robbinsville off guard. No, Cherokee did what they've been doing on film all year, but they do it well. And slowly but surely, uh, Cherokee's starting to, to move some guys around and find some guys that can catch the ball. And then, obviously, Don Bradley's dangerous. He puts the ball on time. I mean, you see a great triple option look there. Um, and, you know, they, they use Chase Calhoun. I think he had a receiving touchdown we might see here in a minute. Um, but, you know, Cherokee, give credit to Cherokee. You know, obviously, I think even with a healthy Cutler Adams, Cherokee still may have won this game. They're so much better than people thought they'd be this year. I mean, they are uh, – they're a team that – Second place in the conference might not be out of reach for them, Jake. Yeah, I mean, they give Murphy a run for their money two weeks ago, and everybody's like, well, Murphy just must have had a bad night. And then they go and beat, beat Robbinsville 20-7. to I mean, that's the two top teams in the conference historically that you've played, lost one game by one, and then, and then won by two scores uh, in the other one. So, I mean, they're definitely for real. They, they just – they do some things differently that is not always prepared for. Um, there was I don't that think. Calhoun touchdown. Yeah, they do some things differently that's not always prepared for. And here's the here's the big kickoff fumble, I think, that was taken in for a touchdown. Yeah, that was it. Um, it, yeah, it wasn't a touchdown there. But it's, it's the very next play, I'm pretty sure, Jake. We have it on the highlight coming up. Um, just one play way later, uh, Don Bradley turns a, a turnover into a touchdown. Yeah, and that's what I mean. That's what good teams do. They beat you if you turn the ball over. They beat you. Um, we didn't see a, as many turnovers as we've seen in the past two games from Robbinsville, but still enough turnovers to impact this this ball game. Um, as Gross throws an interception there, but. Uh, Gross was eight for seventeen for seventy-seven yards, and every one of those balls was caught by Brock Adams. So the emergence of Brock Adams is going to be something, like you mentioned, that they're definitely going to have to rely on, um, especially with Cutler being out. And another thing I want to touch on in this game for Robbinsville is Cutler Adams played the first quarter, had nine carries. Uh, Cage Williams played the entire game and had only had two more carries than Cutler Adams. So I know Cutler Adams, he was only, or I mean, Cage Williams was only averaging three yards uh, per carry, but that's just the kind of back he does. I mean, you get three yards, three yards per carry, you're going to get first down and you're going to score a touchdown. Uh, if he's good for three yards every time you give him the football. So once again, just like last week, still not sure why Cage Williams usage rate is not going up, especially with no Cutler Adams. Yeah, and, and to be honest, like, I, I'm not going to throw too much shade here, Jake. Why did Cutler Adams play? I mean, obviously, we know the kid's got an injury. Um, he's only a sophomore. I, I, I'm hoping they shelve him for the rest of the season, not as a, you know, other teams will then have a better chance to beat Robbinsville. But, you know, protect a kid that's got college college potential. 
Um, and so I, I hope uh, best wishes to Cutler and hope he gets healthy um, as he's got a really bright future. Um, but I think one of the things that we're going to have to see from Robinson is they're going to have to find someone else to run the ball other than just Cage Williams if Cutler's gone. You know, if, if Cutler's uh, going to be limited or out for the year, um, you know, and one of the things I might look to do, uh, I, I know this is a really small sample size, Jake. Uh, Brock Adams, who had a great game receiving, he only has three carries this year, but three carries for 25 yards. Uh, and I'm sure that was probably on a, on jet sweeps and stuff. You know, do you start to move uh, Brock Adams around and play him at, you know, maybe like Andrews has started to use Isaac Weaver? Do you move Brock Adams around and, and let him play running back, slot, wide receiver? Like, you know, get creative. I, I think D. Walsh is going to have to go back into his playbook where he was at with Robbinsville five, six, seven years ago before he started getting some really dominant teams. Uh, and, and do we see some of his old creativity come out that he's not needed to use in the past couple of years when he's just had teams that were head and shoulders better than most? Yeah, I agree. Um, there's definitely, I mean, the the Adams situation, color Adams situation sucks. It's terrible uh, that the kid's injured and wish him nothing but the best for sure. Um, and you mentioned shelving him for the rest of the year. Yeah, that's probably the smart thing to do in the long run. But I also know how badly these kids want to be yeah. out there and play. I mean, they've only got four years of football um, guaranteed. And, and, and even even then, it's not always guaranteed. So they're going to want to get as many snaps and as many reps as they can. Um, but definitely best, West, best wishes uh, to Cutler. And we do hope that he gets healthy because he's definitely got – D1 potential. He's one of the best players I've seen come through the Smoky Mountain Conference in a very long time. Um, and we want to watch him. I I, I, I think if – Kyle... I, I hope he gets healthy, Jake, and we can see a 2,000-yard season his junior year and a 2,500-yard a season his senior year. Um, I just – I hope, you know, they whatever the details of the injury are, uh, we're not privy to. I just hope he gets healthy. Um, as we said, we can't say enough how special he is. Yeah, I agree. I think with a healthy Cutler junior and senior year, they at least one of those two years will be playing in a state championship game. Um, in my opinion, that's that's how good they're going to be uh, in the coming years. Uh, even after even after these seniors that they're going to lose this year, I think they're going to reload pretty quickly. And Cutler and Cage's senior years, Black Knights are really going to be something special. But let's move on to another surprise, Caleb Andrews suffers their first defeat of the season at the hands of Swain. And it seems like it repeat history repeats itself every year. Nobody wants to go play in Bryson city and, and the Maroon devil showed you why Friday night. Well, and I, I think one, the Maroon devil defense is for real. Um, the Maroon devil offense is dependent upon the big play, Jake, but they got a couple of, I mean, heck you, you're going to see one in a minute, a 99 yard run by the quarterback. I mean, from their own one yard line, that that iced the game, you know. Um, but uh, Andrews, just you know, you watch that whole game, Jake. So so tell us what you think. But um, it looked like Weaver and Martin were not, but, but neither of them were a hundred percent for this game, or they both got banged up a little bit, um, and that hurt them as much on defense as it did on offense at times. Yeah, I definitely would not hit the panic button if you're Andrews. I mean, you're sitting at five and one. You just suffered your first loss um, six games into the season, and most of your guys were were banged up, like you mentioned. I mean, for the third and fourth quarter, Isaac and Austin were in and out of the ball game, and those are two guys Andrews has to have in the ball game pretty much every play on both sides of the football uh, in order to compete. Um, but I mean, credit hats off to Swain. Here's that 99-yard uh, run. My goodness. Yeah, right here is Gabe Lillard, quarterback for Swain, taking it all the way to the house from his own one-yard line. Um, but at, hats off to Swain. They are the kind of football team that is going to win games uh, in an ugly fashion. They're not the most fun, flashy team to watch. I mean, they're not going to throw it all over the field. They're not going to run it, uh, run run jet sweeps and all, all kinds of stuff like that. They're, they're going to stick to their veer. Uh, and, and run what they've always ran for the past 20 years. I mean, Blankenship obviously knows what he's doing um, as he's got a team that maybe talent-wise isn't one of the best he's ever coached, but it's still sitting pretty in. I mean, 
tied with Murphy uh, at, at top of the conference. And I would say that the biggest game of the year, maybe, depending on what happens this weekend, is going to be when Murphy goes to Swain uh, in two weeks. Yeah, I mean, I think for Swain, uh, the biggest thing for them is going to be their defense, I think, is capable of doing doing anything they need to to keep them in games. But can they find offensive consistency? Because I think when you play a team like Murphy, Murphy's not going to give up, or you get to the playoffs, Murphy's not going to give you up the 80 yarders, Jake, the the 30 plus yard plays that uh, the Maroon Devil offense has become dependent on. You know what I mean? Uh, You know, so, but the biggest thing that Swain does, um, you know, they're, uh, they're, you know, if you've ever heard the term in college football called trestle ball, back when Jim Trestle was the coach at Ohio State, is we're going to play the field position game. We're not going to get penalties. We're not going to have turnovers. And we're going to force you to out-execute us. And, you know, early in the year, we saw them lose a couple of games that they were really close in because teams did out-execute them and maybe had just a little bit more talent than them. But what you're starting to see out of Swain is they're starting to figure some stuff out. They're starting to figure out who their playmakers are. And simply put, they don't beat themselves, Jake. They don't turn the ball over, and they don't get many penalties. I mean, yeah, simple stuff like they're recovering onside kicks. They do, they do the little things right. Very true. They played that game perfectly. I mean, you saw they put the ball on the ground, I think, twice, and their own like they recovered their own fumble. So uh, that game could have went either way, I think. But on the other hand, it still felt like Swain was in control the whole way. Yeah. Um, but as always, I mean, one of those fumbles goes to to Andrews. Um, then it's going to be it's going to be a lot tighter than than what the final score was. Uh, but. For me, for Andrews and Cherokee, two teams that stick out in my head, they've got to figure out their kicking game or some some. They've got to figure something out, um, special teams wise, when they go to get those extra points. Because Cherokee loses that game against Murphy because they have to go for two because they don't trust their kicker. Andrews had a chance to come back in this one in the fourth quarter. Um, when it was 12 to 21, they had the football, but even then, if they would have scored and got the two, it wouldn't have been enough, uh, to, to tie the ball game up. And they only, they only had one final possession with enough time on the clock to score. Um, so even if they were able to drive all the way down the field and score, it wouldn't have been enough. So those, that one point is very crucial. Um, just ask the Braves with, after their loss, uh, to Murphy. So, Andrew's got to figure something out kicking wise. And so does Cherokee if they want to make a deep run um, into the playoffs. Absolutely. Let's take a break, Caleb. And when we come back, let's talk about the <laughs> craziness of the RPI and compare it to the max preps rankings and stuff like that. So let's take a break and we'll be right back. At Circuit World, we offer a wide selection of major appliances, name brands like Whirlpool, LG, Frigidaire, and more. Looking for furniture? Come by and browse our showroom or check out the Endless Aisle, a touchscreen kiosk with thousands of options. Need electronics? Gaming computers, laptops, desktops, tablets, we have it all. OLED or QLED, 4K or high def, we have the selection to get you the TV of your dreams. And don't forget, at Circuit World, your credit is always good. So ask about our convenient payment options and 120 days, same as cash. Come see us today at one of our Five area locations. Hey, girl. Back so soon? Yeah. Third time this morning. Feeling too familiar with the bathroom these days? It's not just you. Hey, girl. Look who made it 15 minutes. At Erlanger Urology, we make it easy to talk about overactive bladder and treatments that work. Hey, girl. You not coming in? No, I'm good. Well, okay. I'll be here because I'm stuck. Learn more at itsnotjustyou.com. Erlanger Urology. 
In 1981, Reed Nicholson began selling tires out of an old barn in Mineral Bluff. Little did he know that he had just laid the groundwork for the most trusted names in automotive services in the Blue Ridge area. In 1997, Nicholson Tire Center became what it is today, holding the same values of faith, family, and great customer service. Two locations to serve you, and the Blue Ridge location is currently expanding to offer fast service and the largest U-Haul provider in Georgia. Nicholson Tire Center, Blue Ridge, and Mineral Bluff. Welcome back. West North Carolina edition of the Friday Night Press Box presented by Team FY and Sports. Jake West with Caleb Tallman. Caleb, pop up the RPI graphic and let's talk about <laughs> let's, talk, let's just talk about it. What are, what are your thoughts on 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 this uh this RPI stuff right here? Um yeah, it's it's there. Uh very interesting, Jake. Um Swain at number three did not see that coming. You know, uh, I mean, hey, not to give credit to Swain, great win, but but I'll tell you what, you look at that second column, and that tells you why Swain's ranked where they're at. That 73, it's opponent win percentage. And um, you know, let's let's compare Swain to say Andrews. Andrews got a much higher team winning percentage at number eight, but Swain's op opponent winning percentage, you know obviously shows that they've played a really, really strong schedule. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And and Swain at three is a big surprise. But I think the biggest surprise is Robbinsville being at 21. Of 36 teams in Western 1A football, Robbinsville is not number 21. Obviously, they're in a down year, but they are not. There's not 20 teams better than Robbinsville <laughs> in in Western North Carolina in 1A. There's just not. Which, um, which so. hey, look at this one, though, Jake. I know this is outside our conference, so I'll only spend a second on it. Look at number seven, Starmount. I, have no, I don't even know Starmount's mascot. Couldn't tell you a single player on their team. All I know is that a team that has a losing record should not be number seven. Yeah, I agree. And obviously, um, all this is with a grain of salt, as all that will change uh, as the year goes on. But also, um, one of the things to remember is the team that wins the conference is going to get the higher seed no matter the RPI ranking. So if something does happen and Robbinsville does pull it out and they are able to win the conference, then they'll get the one of one of the top seeds. Yeah, they'll be like I think it's like they'll they'll be guaranteed like the seven seed, I think. Yeah. So I'm not sure how they'll rank the conference champs, but you'll be one through seven, one through eight. Um so that's that that the conference, maybe more so in the past, is is going to it's gonna mean a lot to win the conference because with this RPI stuff, you really don't know where you're gonna be ranked at any given week. And and like you said, it'll level out some because when all our conference teams play each other, like then it'll level out after that last game of the season. But then what you will see what matters is is who your opponents were. And yeah. that that'll be one of the biggest indicators. And so on one hand, if you got a good ball club, you need to make a good schedule against teams that are gonna win games in future years, you know? That way that way you, you're playing opponents that have high winning percentages if you can win those games. But then again, even it's like, it, it seems like to me, it'd be better to go three and two in non-conference, but have your opponents have an 80% win percentage than it would be to go five and oh in non-conference and play a bunch of 500 teams. You know what I mean? It's just, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, like look at star Mount, they're not above 500 and they, they're what? Seventh. They're ranked yeah, above. Seven. They're ranked above Andrews. He's lost one game. So, it, I don't know. It's crazy. People love it. People hate it. Uh, but it's very different from what we've used in the past, the Max Preps rankings. Max Preps has Eastern Randolph 1, Mount Airy 2. And, and, and those That's are the same, much, at least. Yeah, those are pretty much the only two that are the same. Um, they've got Mitchell 3, Thomasville 4, Mount Heritage 5, Murphy at 6. Uh, so, Murphy's not really moving up or down. Um, as you see there, they're five in RPI and they're six in max preps. Uh, but Swain is seven, uh, according to max preps and RPI has them at three, Thomas Jefferson at eight, Andrews at nine, 
And then Mountain Island Charter at 10, who's not even in the top 10 uh, RPI rankings. Uh, I don't even know if they were in the top 15 RPI rankings. But the biggest change is Slane from 3 to 7, and then Robbinsville from 21 to 13. Max Preps has Robbinsville at 13, which in my eyes is probably what they are. Um, I may, they have Robbinsville at 13 and Cherokee at 14. I'd probably flip flop those just because, I mean, Cherokee obviously, um, was able to get the win. And in my opinion, Cherokee may be a top 10 team in, in Western 1A, but we'll, we'll find out this week when they play Andrews, if they really are a top 10 team. Um, and then Hayesville at 23. So not, not a whole lot of shifting for Hayesville. Um, but good thing for, uh, Hayesville and, and some of these smaller schools is all, I think pretty much everybody except besides two teams in the Western region are going to make the playoffs. And I'm confused because I'm pretty sure last time I looked at it, Jake, the East has 31 teams. So are we going to take a West team and toss them in the East or will the number one seed in the East have a when, – when you split up, I, here's what I don't get, Jake. It just shows you the rationale of the NCHSAA. So the NCHSA had um, 60 – 63 teams, right? And we're going to say, let's put 31. Or no, no, no. They had they had uh, 65 um, teams, Jake. So they're saying, let's put 31 in the East and 34 in the West. I mean, like, just stick one more team in the East, at least. Or two more. Like, you know, level it out. It just it makes no sense. But yeah, I'll, I'll ultimately, because I, I know we got to get to our games this week, um, you know, I do think what we're starting to see is I bet by the end of the season, the max preps and the RPI will probably – most teams will be within three or four spots uh, of each other. I do think, um, talking about the East for a second, that the one seed does get a buy. So, as of right now, Eastern Randolph, is there, they're one in the RPI right now. Or not Eastern Randolph, they're in the West. But um, I think Tarboro maybe one in the East uh, will get a – First round, first round bye. Um, so good. <laughs> lucky for lucky for that number one seed in the East. But uh, with the expanded, back to the expanded playoffs, um, a lot of those teams, a lot of those um, first and second round games will will pretty much be blowouts because it'll be um, a number one seed versus the number thirty two seed or whatever. Uh, we may end up seeing Eastern Randolph <laughs> and Rosman playing. Uh, so that will, that I mean those first second round games are aren't going to be much fun to watch. Um, but let's move on, Caleb, to preview the week nine games. Talk about Franklin versus Smoky Mountain. I think both of those teams do they still have a chance to win the the conference? Franklin, Jake, probably not. As when you look at their conference, just give me two seconds. I'm pulling up their their conference rankings. Franklin has already lost to Tuscola. And Pisgah. So they currently sit number uh, four in their conference at two and two. Um, Pisgah and Tuscola are at the top of the conference, three and oh. And then this is a big game for Smoky Mountain because if you're Smoky Mountain, you're two and one in conference right now. So what you're hoping to have happen if you're Smoky Mountain is you beat Franklin, Tuscola beats Pisgah, and you, Pisgah, and Tuscola all finish with one loss at the top of the conference, because I just – North Henderson, West Henderson, and, and East Henderson are your bottom three teams in the conference, and I don't see any of those three teams beating anyone but each other in conference. They're not going to pull an upset uh, on Smoky Mountain or Franklin or Tuscola or Pisgah, barring something strange. So Franklin's probably out of the conference race. Uh, for first place, but like then if you're Franklin, you're hoping that you beat Smoky Mountain. Smoky Mountain can be heck, maybe you know one go one and one against Tuscola and Pisgah, and then you can finish in a tie for second is probably your best shot um, for Franklin, unless you know a miracle happens in one of the Hendersonvilles uh, or one of the Hendersons Northwest or East can pull a massive upset. What's the – let's see, there it rolls across right there. Franklin's a seven-and-a-half-point favorite in that game against Smoky Mountain. Um, I know we haven't seen a whole lot of Smoky Mountain, but they're 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 just on the edge of our coverage area. 
What's your prediction uh, for this game after Franklin got back on track last week with a win, and I think Smoky Mountain was on a bye? Yeah, here's the hard thing about Smoky Mountain, Jake. They're so up and down. I mean, let's look at their schedule. We obviously know that Cherokee is a lot better than we thought they were. They beat Cherokee 41 to 13 the first week of the season. Second week of the season, they lose 21 to 9 to Swain, can't get anything going on offense, and gave Swain a defensive touchdown. Okay, the week after that, they play a good 4A TC Robertson and beat them 35 to 12. I, I mean, like, and then, then two weeks later, their next game, they lose to Pisgah. So it's, you know, Big. The bigger question in this game is which Smoky Mountain team shows up, I, I guess is my question. So I would give the edge to Franklin because other than some special teams touchdowns, Franklin's pretty consistent uh, in what they do. And so I will always choose the consistent team over the hot and cold team. Yeah, but I think uh, on the other end, that same could be said for Franklin. Um, they come out. First, what, four games of the season look like world beaters and then drop two back-to-back. Um, so it's kind of the same hand-in-hand, hand, like what Monkey Mountain team is going to show up, but also what Franklin team is going to show up. Is it going to be the Franklin team that manhandled Murphy all the way through, or is it going to be the Franklin team that struggled in the first half with Hayesville and then struggled all the way through with Swain and then lost those back-to-back -back games? Um, but I think – what we saw with uh, Kellen on the ground, Kellen Styles on the ground last week, um, I think that's that they're, that's really going to help them if, if they keep handing him the football. And, and McGuire's able to complete passes um, at a pretty pretty high click, then I think Franklin can handle this game and they can cover. Uh, so I'm going to go with, with, with the Panthers by a touchdown. Yeah, so, so do I. And I, I think the biggest thing in this game is when you look at their schedule – uh, Smoky Mountain does well against other teams that are similar to them uh, being undisciplined. But when they play disciplined opponents like a Swain or a Pisgah, they lose. And so if you can see the disciplined version of Franklin, which I think is likely, I think I, you get Franklin the edge. Yeah, I agree. That's um, Speaking of Swain, Swain takes on um... – Hayesville this week, and again, it's live on FYNTV.com. Swain, a 21-and-a-half point favorite. Uh, what are your thoughts on this one going in? Uh, as it, it is at Hayesville, so Hayesville's not going to have the trouble of going and playing in Bryson City. But um, just what are your initial thoughts on this one as Swain comes off a big win against Andrews, Hayesville coming off a big loss to Murphy? Um, what do you think is going to happen in week nine here? Well, you and I talked about this, Jake. Um which Hayesville team shows up? I mean, we saw Hayesville play Franklin and Tuscola really tough in two first halves. And it's obviously turned out to be that Franklin and Tuscola are really good teams. Um, and so I, I know one thing that's helped Hayesville out is all their JVs are up. Uh, a couple of them are helping, which that's just help with roster depth. You know, like a lot of them, you know, you're not going to see those freshmen out there uh, starting at wide receiver or left tackle or anything, but they've taken on a lot of the special teams roles uh, fairly effectively and, and done well for Hayesville in those roles. Uh, and so that's going to help the Yellow Jackets. Um, and I think Hazel has the mo more potent offense. Um, and if they can stay disciplined and not turn over the football, I think, especially at home, this game could be a lot closer than people think. Um, but if, if Hayesville's still struggling with turnovers and penalties, um, you know, then Swain's going to roll. I mean, if, if we're just being honest. But uh, one of the things I would look for Hayesville to do is can Hayesville, the biggest key to this game for them is, because let, let's be honest, if there's turnovers and penalties, we know the way the game's going to go for Hayesville. But if they're to keep it close, what's going to keep it close for them is can they find a way to finish in the red zone? Because at one point, if you take away Hayesville's, uh, fumble fumble that gave Murphy a fumble recovery touchdown. And then you give Hayesville, uh, you know, if they can score on three or four red zone possessions instead of one of four, they may go to half or somewhere in the third quarter, you know, down just a touchdown or, or two touchdowns to Murphy. And it's a lot closer game going into the fourth quarter. Um, so that's the thing is, is Swain's not going to come out 
Uh, I just don't think they have the offense to, you know, to, to cover a 21 and a half point spread. Um, especially cause I think Hazel will be able to score a little bit. It'll just depend. Um, can Hazel be disciplined, which they've struggled with this year? I, I think I agree. I don't know if Swain's going to cover 21 and a half point spread. Um, but I do think that they should be able to win this game. Um, by 10 to 14 points if they play uh, as well as they did last week. Um, Hayesville's just got to – they for one, they've got to get Jake McTaggart back. Um, he's got to get back out there on the field because Caldwell obviously is a completely different quarterback when he's got his D1 tight end out there um, than if he doesn't. We saw that in the Andrews game. Uh, it just it's some It's like a security blanket whenever you can throw it up to a guy that's 6'6", six, six, um, and can come down with any with any ball. So they've got to get him back. Um, and who knows if that'll be this week or if it'll be next week or if he'll if he'll come back at all. Um, but Hazel's got to get him back. And Hazel's got to. I know they're a young team, but they've got to become more disciplined. As you mentioned, um, they can't they can't be. They just don't. They don't have the numbers um, on, on and the roster depth to to give free possessions to the other team and still be able to compete. Um, but I think Swain rolls this one, two touchdown win at Hayesville. Um, I don't think it gets out of hand like the Murphy game did uh, just because Swain's firepower on offense isn't good. Isn't as, as, as good as Murphy's, but uh, I still think Swain takes care of business and they're, they're still, they're going to be two and zero in conference after this week. Um, but tell us about another game we've got on FYNTV.com, Caleb, as we've got Andrews hosting Cherokee. That is – that's – I mean, with all the injuries and stuff in the Murphy-Robbinsville game, I, you could argue this is the game of the week. Yeah, it really could be. Uh, and it seems like, Jake, every single time we, we get an FYN TV game and Andrews, it, it usually turns out to be a good one. I mean, look at the Mitchell game we had on FYN TV – uh this year that, that's when i like going back to look at because every time i go back to look at it the views have gone up because it's such a great game people like watching it um you know biggest question for me in this game is is andrew's healthy jake because if you don't have weaver and martin close to 100 percent, i don't see a way they win this game without those two guys and we saw that be a big struggle for them against um against swain um they do have the benefit of being at home uh, so Cherokee struggles a little bit when they're away from their nice turf field at times. Um, but Cherokee's line play, uh, I mean, you, you saw it, they played Murphy and their, their line play stood the test against Murphy. Um, it, you know, Cherokee's line play won the test against Robbinsville surprisingly. And so I just don't know that, you know, Martin's not going to be able to get his four and five yard carries every single play like he does against some teams. Uh, And so you're going to have to find a way, Jake. You can't have a two for 17 passing night. It doesn't have to be great. It doesn't even have to be over 50%. But if you can have a, you know, I don't know, a five for 11, five for 12 passing night, but those five passing plays are, you know, seam routes and go routes. uh, So at at least you're stretching the defense. Um, Andrews has to have some type of air action, just enough to keep Cherokee honest. And if you don't, you're going to see, uh, Elijah, Elijah Twatty and, and, and the Cherokee Braves just run downhill at the, at the Andrews run game all night. And it's going to be a tough night for Andrews. <clears throat> yeah. I think back to the Andrews passing game, they, it seems like they are either bubble screen or taking a shot. And I think they've got to get something in the middle there, um, whether it's like a crossing route, uh, something over the middle. They need to take advantage of the middle of the field. Um, and I, I know they're trying to stretch it out and, and, and kind of get people out of the box when they do go to pass. But you got to take pass completions where you can get them. Um, and whether that be over the, over the middle of the field or, or, or deep. It's or, predictable. Yeah, or the screen. Um, just going back to the Hayesville game, I don't remember seeing Bateman throw a ball that went over the middle. I think he, he completed the touchdown pass to Weaver. Um, 
that was kind of a fade into the end zone, I guess, um, if I remember correctly. And then they threw a, a few screens to to Weaver. Uh, so I just think um, they've they've got they've got Cameron Rattler. He's a big receiver, number nine. Uh, maybe try to get him going over across the middle, or even uh, just out of the backfield. I'm not sure how good Austin Martin's hands are, but if you get him going in the pass game, uh, that could that could really be dangerous. If you can line up back there with Weaver and Martin and and and, and Bateman, and not know whether they're going to pass or run with either one of those kids, uh, then that's something that could really be dangerous. Um, I don't know. I think Bateman is a good enough athlete. Uh, to correct some things, he's just got to be more accurate throwing the football. Obviously, that was the name of the game last week. And I think Andrews has, I mean, that six and they're favored by six and a half points. I would say that that's mostly because this game's at home. Um, and the home Matt, field- yeah, when you look at the Massey ratings, Jake, uh, home field advantage is worth six to seven and a half points. So, I mean, it's this is a neutral game on a neutral field. Yeah, I think – I mean, what – you think Andrews wins wins this game or do you think Cherokee, Cherokee, Cherokee comes in and, and – I think and Cherokee rolls? comes in. I think Cherokee comes in. And I think it could be really close. Uh, but I think what you're, you're going to start to see with Andrews is when they get late in games, if it's a close game and they need to score uh, in any type of quick fashion, they don't have the offense to do it. I think – and I mentioned this last week – when Andrews went to Swain, I said, as long as the moment doesn't get too big for those young kids at Andrews, then they should be able to win that game. I think the bright lights and, and being over there in Bryson City um, and just the pressure of a 5-0 and record got to those young kids, and they, and they weren't able to play their best ball game. Uh, but I think this week, being at home, I'm going to say that Andrews does get it done. I don't know. I don't even know if they cover the spread. This may be a, a one point one point ball game, four points somewhere in there. But it comes back to the fact that Andrews has now with with Adams being injured and not being a hundred percent, without a doubt Andrews at this moment has the two best backs in the conference. And I just think if if those kids are healthy and which I think, which I think they'll they'll be ready to go come come tomorrow night. I think those kids are going to really give them give Cherokee a run for their money, um, and take not to take anything away from the Braves. I'm just I still believe in Andrews, and I think that they can kind of breathe a sigh of relief if it makes sense that they're not undefeated anymore. Um, I think that's going to help them in the long run that they lost right now uh, because each week. It gets tougher and tougher to be that that lone undefeated team. But Caleb, yeah. let's take, let's take a let's take a quick break. We've got about twelve minutes left here in the show, and and let's let's highlight our our game of the week, Robbinsville and Murphy. Um, and do you have any any closing thoughts on the Andrews Cherokee game? Yeah, the one thing I'll say is you said you could see Cher- uh, Andrews winning by one or two points. Uh, extra points and two point conversions become a massive deal if if you're if you think it's going to be that close. Yeah, yeah, and but that I think it's Andrews because I think Andrews has a better chance at converting converting those two point conversions um, than Cherokee because Cherokee struggles in the kicking game also. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It goes both ways. The game literally could come down to when you look at the end of the game, which team converted more of their extra point opportunities. Yeah, I agree. Let's take a quick break, Caleb, and come back and uh, we'll hear some words from uh, Murphy Bulldogs head coach Joseph Watson, and we'll 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 highlight. Um, the main points going into this Robbinsville Murphy game is Murphy hosts the Black Knights Friday night um, at Bob Hendricks Memorial. Let's take a break. We'll be right back.
At Circuit World, we offer a wide selection of major appliances, name brands like Whirlpool, LG, Frigidaire, and more. Looking for furniture? Come by and browse our showroom or check out the Endless Aisle, a touchscreen kiosk with thousands of options. Need electronics? Gaming computers, laptops, desktops, tablets, we have it all. OLED or QLED, 4K or high def, we have the selection to get you the TV of your dreams. And don't forget, at Circuit World, your credit is always good. So ask about our convenient payment options and 120 days, same as cash. Come see us today at one of our five area locations. Hey girl, back so soon? Yeah, third time this morning. Feeling too familiar with the bathroom these days? It's not just you. Hey girl, look who made it 15 minutes. At Erlanger Urology, we make it easy to talk about overactive bladder and treatments that work. Hey girl, you not coming in? No, I'm good. Well, okay, I'll be here because I'm stuck. Learn more at itsnotjustyou.com. Erlanger Urology. In 1981, Reed Nicholson began selling tires out of an old barn in Mineral Bluff. Little did he know that he had just laid the groundwork for the most trusted names in automotive services in the Blue Ridge area. In 1997, Nicholson Tire Center became what it is today, holding the same values of faith, family, and great customer service. Two locations to serve you, and the Blue Ridge location is currently expanding to offer fast service and the largest U-Haul provider in Georgia. Nicholson Tire Center, Blue Ridge, and Mineral Bluff. Welcome back, Jake West, Caleb Tallman, West North Carolina edition of the Friday Night Press Box presented by Team FY and Sports. Um, Caleb, getting into this Murphy-Robbinsville game, it seems like it's kind of lost its luster. Um, there's definitely not the hype around it that was around this game last year. No, absolutely not. Um, but never say never, right, Jake? Anytime Murphy-Robbinsville, Murphy-Swain, or Robbinsville Swain match up. I don't care. Throw away the records, and who the heck knows what could happen. I mean, we saw that, uh, and you, you're a Murphy guy, so remind me. Wasn't a couple years ago like Gentry was looking for, you know, a record-setting win, and they went up to Swain and got and got upset, right? Uh, no, they, they, it was a lot they closer than it was supposed to be. They won the game 14 13, or 15 14. They, they yeah, so, two so it was, but it was way closer than anyone thought it would be. Yeah, and that just, I mean, <laughs> I'm going to keep saying it every week. It <laughs> that goes back to how hard it is to play uh, in Bryson City at Swain. Um, but back to this game, I think a lot of, uh, especially, especially, I don't think the Murphy guys, but especially like the, the, the Robbinsville um, posters on in, on NC preps and, and the ones that uh, you hear the most from um, are kind of talking like they don't really think this is going to be a great game without Cutler. Um, I think, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion at all. Who's going to win this ball game. Um, I mean, anytime it's a rivalry like this goes back, takes me to college basketball um, when, when Duke and UNC Chapel Hill play, it doesn't matter if one team's ranked number one overall that year uh, and one team's not even in the top 25, that game's going to be close. And, and that's how this game is. Um, I think – I do think it comes down to um, the turnover battle, as always, uh, with Robbinsville and Murphy. Um, the regular season game last year, Murphy turned the ball over too much to be able to win. And the more disciplined team's always going to win this game. So I think that gives Murphy the edge because they're older and they have played more disciplined football this year. And also the the injuries to Robbinsville may just be too much to overcome. Um, but I do not think this is going to be a three-score game like people, like people are saying uh, that it might be. I mean, I really think it might, Jake. I just think – I think – Part of what's happening is Robinsville's had a roller coaster season. Really, Murphy has in some aspects, uh, but Murphy Murphy's starting to climb the mountain and get to um, their peak form. And Robinsville was in peak form game one of the season and has been on a slow, steady decline ever since. Really, um, and so I think if you're if you're a Murphy fan, uh, you're catching Robinsville at the perfect time. Your team's starting to play as good as they've played all year long. And Robinsville has shown that they're, they've got question marks. They've got injuries. 
Um, you know, but hey, D. Walsh, maybe he he reaches into his bag of tricks and we see a double pass and a, you know, um a surprise onside kick because they do have uh if if you're gonna give Robinsville one distinctive advantage in this game, Jake, it's probably special teams with the kicker they have. Yeah, I would agree. Special teams definitely in favor of Robbinsville. But you mentioned the double pass. I guarantee you we'll see a double pass. We've seen it a few times from Robbinsville this year. We saw it in the Western Regional Championship last year when Murphy and Robbinsville played. Uh, that seems to be the one trick play Robbinsville goes back to. Um, and I, I would almost – I think there's a 90% chance we see a double pass from Robbinsville or some kind of um, figuration of a play like that. Because um, that's what it's going to take, especially if – if Cutler Adams doesn't play in this ball game, it's going to take trick plays and onside kicks um, to be able to win because we haven't seen any offensive output from anybody on Robbinsville aside from Cutler. And yeah. but Robbinsville also has guys that make me say it's not going to be a blowout two three score game because if Cage what if Cage Williams gets rolling? What if Rob what if the Robbinsville the game one Robbinsville team shows up? Uh, that played against Asheville, and I, and I know Cutler was a big part of all that. But what if what if Dason Gross comes out and him and Brock Adams just light it up? I mean, I definitely don't think it's a foregone conclusion at all because of just that kind of athletes that Robbinsville has. Um, they they just they match they match up well, and they always do. Uh, it's really going to come down to the Murphy defense. Murphy defense is going to have to punch him in the mouth. Um, and give their offense an opportunity to score uh, because when their offense has had those opportunities in the past, uh, they've made the most of them. Obviously, the best unit for Murphy is their offense right now with the way they're playing. And if their defense can get a few stops, then, yeah, maybe it will get out of hand um, early on. But I just don't see it. I mean, unless unless Robbinsville doesn't, doesn't travel well, and I don't – I don't know why they wouldn't travel well. I mean, it's only 45 minutes over here, and I'm talking about their fan base. If you look over there and you see a lot of aluminum and you don't see a lot of butts and seats, then Murphy's going to have a really, really big advantage because um, obviously with the way things are going, people are thinking Murphy's going to win this game, and so a lot of people are going to show up to watch um, their Bulldogs in a game that they think they can win. Yeah, and I think one of the things uh... – I think Robinsville is going to have some offensive wrinkles, obviously, especially if Cutler doesn't play, or even if Cutler plays a little bit like he did last week. Um, because if you're going to have a chance for Murphy, you've got to put their defense in precarious situations. Because one of the things we've seen from Murphy is their defensive game plans coming in are pretty solid. But you, you've you seen this as well, Jake. They struggle in-game adjustments. And, like, one of the things, you know – you talked about Dason Gross and, and Brock Adams getting hot. I think that's going to be tough because from what we've seen from Robbinsville, they've really only – I mean, I'm pulling up their stats right now. Their next leading receiver behind Brock Adams, Brock Adams has 25 receptions for 343 yards. Uh, their next leading receiver only has four receptions. So if you're Murphy, uh, Juan Allen's going to follow Brock Adams all over the field and Peyton McCracken's going to be the safety over top probably. Uh, and so – can you find a way to get Brock Adams into better situations? Maybe that's playing him at running back. Maybe that's lot putting him in motion a lot, those kind of things. Um, but as we wrap up here, you know, Robinsville is going to have to come out with some trick plays and they're going to have to find a way to surprise Murphy, which don't put it past D Walsh. D Walsh uh, at one time was probably the most creative offensive mind in all of Western North Carolina. And he's gotten away from that because his teams have been so good and he's not needed the creativity, but um, D might be going right back to where he's comfortable. Yeah, we got about a minute left. Caleb, what's your prediction in this one? Uh, who and by how much? Murphy, and they'll cover the spread. I think I'd say a two-score game. I think I think Murphy also. I think Murphy by 14, um, but I think it's close. For it's probably it's close for probably three quarters. I just think in the fourth, the home field advantage is too much, going to be too much, and Robinsville's really going to be missing Cutler if he doesn't play. But if Cutler is out there, and if Cutler somehow is <laughs> quarter zoned up and he's healthy and he's not feeling a thing, um, this could go all the way down to the wire, and it could be Murphy could be in another one point one point battle. But Caleb, thanks for joining me. 
Uh, for Caleb Tallman, this is Jake West. This is the Western North Carolina edition of the Friday Night Press Box, presented by Team FY and Sports. Uh, please watch all, all of our games this weekend. We've got Hayesville and Swain on FYNTV.com. We've also got Cherokee and Andrews. Uh, Cherokee and Andrews is going to be a really big game. So um, that'll be live on FY, FYNTV.com for free. Um, thanks, Caleb.